We Americans are told to remember our history, but not all of it. Although the greatest generation of World War II is still very much on our minds, in our books, and on our movie screens, many of these men and women, even those who were stars in their day, were forgotten. I'd like to talk about some of them, and I'll begin with the African Americans of D-Day in my book, Forgotten. In June of 2009, for the 65th anniversary of D-Day, the French government honored an American veteran named William Garfield Dabney. They gave Bill the Legion of Honor, France's highest decoration, for his service during the Battle of Normandy on June 6, 1944. Bill Dabney was a member of the 320th Anti-Aircraft Barrage Balloon Battalion, the only African-American combat unit at D-Day. The men of the 320th were charged with an unusual mission, to raise a curtain of silvery balloons from the ground over Omaha and Utah beaches. Pilots were terrified of the lethal balloon cables that could stall a plane, and especially of the small bombs attached to the balloons that a cable strike unleashed. At that time, the U.S. Army was segregated, and so the 320th was an all-black battalion. What did that mean? It meant that the enlisted men and some of the lower-ranking officers were men of color, but the top officers were always white. Bill Dabney received his medal in Paris. After the ceremony, Bill shook the hands of Steven Spielberg and Tom Hanks, Bill had no idea who they were until his son Vinny told him, but he knew very well that there were no men of color storming Omaha Beach in their movie, Saving Private Ryan. All African-American veterans know this. In fact, no movies about D-Day show back black soldiers in action. Few books about D-Day mention the 320th or that there were nearly 2,000 African-American troops on the Normandy beaches by the end of that extraordinary day. The 320th was among two black units given accommodation for their service, yet we don't know about them. Why does that matter? Well, D-Day was one of the most important days of the 20th century. To exclude a significant portion of our population from that epic battle, does the United States a tremendous disservice. The great general Omar Bradley said that all men who landed on Omaha Beach were heroes, yet there were heroes among the heroes. As I began research into my book, I learned that one of the men of the 320th, a college student, would become a star in black America and beyond for his service on Omaha Beach. He would be nominated for the Medal of Honor. He would not get it. None of the one million African Americans who served in World War II received America's highest honor until 1997, when President Clinton awarded seven of them. Those awards came after an independent study commissioned by the Army found that pervasive racism within the ranks denied deserving Black soldiers the decorations they deserved and the opportunities they deserved. I'd like to tell you about that 320th soldier. His name was Waverly Bernard Woodson Jr. Waverly Woodson's story is extraordinary, but it began with a simple case of beating the odds. Odds were low that a black soldier would even be in the Normandy landings, but Woodson was used to defying expectations. Unlike some of his friends in West Philadelphia, Woodson didn't wait for a draft notice. He enlisted in the army in December, 1942. Remember, there were two armies in America in World War II, black and white. There were two of almost everything, barracks, mess halls, service clubs, buses, train cars, and berths on ships were divided by race. It was a highly inefficient and extremely expensive way to run an army. Yet there was one sector that was integrated, officer candidate school, the Army didn't think that Black men were smart enough to score high enough on the entrance exam, an exam heavily weighted to favor whites, so they didn't bother to set up a separate system. But Woodson passed the test and trained as an anti-aircraft artillery officer. 
In the end, there were no officer positions available to him. This was a common story for black officers whose service was limited by quotas and the rule that they not lead white officers junior to them. So Woodson was assigned to retrain as a medic with the 320th. And that is how Corporal Woodson, 21 years old, found himself on the early morning of June 6, 1944, aboard a boat slicing through the rough seas bound for Omaha Beach. He nearly didn't make it. A shell splashed down near his boat, sending shards of burning shrapnel raining on deck. Woodson's lower extremities burned. He reached down and pulled up a hand covered in blood. I am dying, he thought. Another medic patched him up, and then Woodson got to work treating the injured men all around him. That's what Woodson would do for the next 30 hours before he collapsed from exhaustion and his own injuries. He saved drowning men, patched gaping wounds, extracted bullets, and dispensed blood plasma. He amputated a right foot. We know that Waverly Woodson was nominated for the Medal of Honor. There is a sole piece of paper at the Truman Library in Independence, Missouri that proves this. It is a handwritten note from an aide in the War Department to an aide in the White House that says Woodson was nominated for the Medal of Honor and that the president may wish to award it personally as he has in the case of some white boys. There is no other trace of the records that explain what happened to Waverly Woodson's medals. To the Army, the note in the Truman Library is hearsay, but there is further proof of Woodson's actions. In the summer of 1944, the young medic was a huge star. Newspaper men came to interview him, and Woodson returned home a celebrity. Significantly, stapled to the note in the Truman Library is a press release issued by the Army on August 28, 1944, detailing Woodson's heroism. That the Army would praise the individual actions of a black soldier on Omaha Beach was nothing short of extraordinary. For the 50th anniversary of D-Day, the French government chose a trio of Americans to honor. They flew them to France and presented them with a palm-sized medal commemorating their service in Normandy. They included Waverly Woodson, 72 years old, and his wife, Joanne. Woodson died on August 12, 2005. His grave is at Arlington National Cemetery, where we Americans bury our heroes. Each Memorial Day, Joanne Woodson visits with an armful of her husband's favorite red roses. In June 2015, President Obama awarded the Medal of Honor to a black soldier from World War I named Henry Johnson. Sergeant Johnson was a member of the legendary Harlem Hellfighters, the 369th Infantry from New York. Johnson single-handedly fought off a German raiding party that attacked the trench he was guarding, using up all of his weapons until all that he had left was his bolo knife. Like Woodson, Johnson's heroics made him a star. Yet Johnson died 11 years after the war in poverty without even a purple heart for his injuries and no medical benefits to treat those wartime injuries. Eight decades later at that ceremony at the White House, President Obama said, it is never too late to say thank you. On that note, there is bipartisan legislation pending on Capitol Hill to award Waverly Woodson the Medal of Honor. Please encourage your representatives and your senators to support it. In 1941, the men of the 320th began receiving their draft notices. One of those men was a 21-year-old in Atlantic City, New Jersey, named Wilson Caldwell Monk. At that time, America was not at war, so Wilson Monk expected a one-year commitment. He was in for a surprise and an even bigger surprise when he boarded a train and headed south to his first Army training camp. Somewhere north of Washington, D.C., Monk was told he had to switch to the Negro car. He had no idea what that meant. The Negro car was always hard by the noisy, dirty coal engine, so a soldier in uniform would arrive wherever he was going covered in soot. The train south was the first taste of Jim Crow for the North's black recruits, who would begin their first day of boot camp already fuming. 
Wilson Monk was stationed at Camp Tyson, an army base in northwestern Tennessee, built for the purpose of teaching men to fly barrage balloons. Of the 30 or so units that trained at Tyson, four battalions were black. Sergeant Samuel L. Madison of Columbus, Ohio, described their treatment there this way. We were like little dogs. One day in the spring of 1943, Wilson Monk and some friends boarded a train and headed to Memphis on a weekend pass. Their first stop was a diner where a monk asked for change to play the jukebox. The man behind the counter threw back a handful of nickels and told Monk, if you wasn't in uniform, you wouldn't get a damn thing from me. And it only got worse. Later, Monk and his friends went looking for a place to grab a bite. Outside one restaurant, they watched, incredulous, as a long line of German prisoners of war filed inside. Black men were not welcome there. There were 425,000 German and Italian prisoners of war interned in the United States during World War II, most of them at army bases in the Midwest and South where they enjoyed privileges not accorded to black soldiers. The fact that these enemy prisoners enjoyed often backslapping treatment by their white guards was extremely painful to soldiers like Wilson Monk, who, even seven decades after the war, spoke about it to me with fresh hurt. Despite that hurt and despite the vicious treatment they endured, Monk and his fellow soldiers served our country with bravery and distinction. And they were not alone. Dory Miller was the first hero of World War II, the first. As the Japanese sneak attack shattered a quiet Sunday morning at Pearl Harbor, Miller, a cook aboard the USS West Virginia, jumped behind an anti-aircraft artillery gun and began firing. He took out a few Japanese planes with a gun he had never been trained to use. Fifteen men were awarded the Medal of Honor for their service on December 7, 1941, including the mortally wounded commander of the West Virginia, whom Miller valiantly tried to save. But not Miller. He got the Navy Cross, which, at that time, was third place. And there were many others, to name a few. The 333rd Field Artillery Battalion the 761st Tank Battalion, the Black Panthers, the 92nd Infantry Division, and of course, the legendary Black pilots, the Tuskegee Airmen, who were also forgotten until a TV movie in 1995 brought them back into our popular consciousness. And not just men, African-American women served their country as nurses and clerks, and one battalion was sent overseas to, to deliver tons of backed up mail to millions of American soldiers. The six Triple H worked in shifts around the clock under extremely trying circumstances, but like many deserving black units, they were never given a unit citation. On the subject of decorations, of the D-Day veterans I interviewed, Bill Dabney was not the only one to receive the French Legion of Honor. Henry Parham of the 320th got one too in June 2013 at the French Embassy in Washington, D.C. Henry Parham called his service on Omaha Beach a privilege, even though he said we were treated like second-class citizens. I'd like to close by telling you a story of hope that is perhaps instructive today. In our time, a time of great division, with protests roiling our cities and people crying out to be recognized as equal citizens with equal rights, it is instructive to note how the African Americans of World War II, who were marginalized and reviled in many corners of their own land, were treated abroad. After leaving Tennessee, the men of the 320th boarded train cars headed for New York, where they trudged aboard the Acatania, a luxury ocean liner converted into a troop carrier. It was one of the three fastest ships in the world, packed with thousands of young Americans and Canadians. The Acatania docked in Scotland in November of 1943, and for the next seven months in the villages of England and Wales, the men of the 320th would enjoy a taste of freedom they had never thought possible. In this land, white people were happy to meet them, share their meager war rations, and forge lasting friendships. The importance of these experiences abroad for hundreds of thousands of black GIs cannot be overemphasized. It was epic.
It was through their time abroad in Europe, in the Pacific, even in occupied Germany, that African-American soldiers learned that race hatred was not a natural state of affairs. These wartime experiences abroad would help shape the civil rights movement that would rock our country in the decades to come. Before leaving for Normandy, Sergeant Wilson Monk was billeted in the hall of a stately stone church in a village in Wales. One day, Wilson asked Jeffrey Pryor, the church organist, if he and his friends might attend Sunday services. Of course you can, Jeffrey replied. Jeffrey Pryor had no idea that back home, none of these men would have stepped foot in a white church. Then Jeffrey did his homesick GI one better. He introduced him to his wife, Jessie. The Pryor's 18-year-old son, Keith, was off fighting with the British forces, and Wilson Monk became their surrogate son. Like most Britons, the Pryors had never met a person of color until the Americans came, and they, in turn, were the first white people whom Wilson Monk had ever called his friends. And so, an extraordinary correspondence began between Jesse Pryor in Wales and Wilson Monk's mother, Rosita, back in Atlantic City. I'd like to share one of those letters with you. My dear Mrs. Monk, how are you? I expect you will be very surprised receiving this letter from me. I feel I must write you and tell you how very delighted we are meeting Wilson and having him in our home. Mrs. Monk, you have a son to treasure and feel very proud of. We love him very dearly and will do anything in the world for him. All we regret is we cannot have him home more, but duties won't allow. He does come as often as possible. We have told him he can look upon our home as his home while in our country. And I will try to fill your place if only in a small way. But don't worry too much about him. While he is here, we shall take every care of him. If he is ever ill or in any way wanting us, we shall be there. We look upon him now as our own. Mother to mother, very sincerely with loving thoughts, Jesse Pryor, XXX, XXX. Wilson Monk and his war bride Martina were married for 60 years. Thank you for listening and thank you for supporting our veterans.